Well, we're in a, a, a new series. We're starting a new theme today, and uh, it's called Unveiled. And uh, we're going to be journeying through a, a scripture in 2 Corinthians. And uh, let, let's start with this scripture. It's going to be a base scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I'll, I'll give you just some time to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. This, we're going to be camping around this verse or building from this verse, but we're going to be doing it through the first few chapters of, of Corinthians. Uh, but this is the base verse for this theme, and it is this. But we all, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let's read it one more time because there's some pretty big concepts. I just want that to sit in your spirit this morning. But we all, so everyone, this is written to a church, right? This is not written to church leadership. This is not written to church management. This is written to, not the life group leaders, this is written to all the church. So there's no one this doesn't include this morning. All of us with unveiled face, all right? That doesn't mean no makeup. That means unveiled face because Moses in the Old Testament when he beheld the glory of the Lord, he had to veil his face. But one of the comparisons we're going to see in the New Testament is that actually we now behold the glory, but it's with an unveiled nature and an unveiling procession of God's glory, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. So the glory that you have and the glory that it sits on your countenance this morning is, is a like image to Christ himself. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus, you look like, you look like Jesus. <laughs> so we're beholding the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed into that same image. We're being transformed into the image of Christ. That in, in and of itself is one of the most fundamental building blocks of the Christian walk of faith, is that we're walking into an image of Christ. That tomorrow, because of our faith journey, we should look like, sound like, speak like, act like, behave like, represent like Jesus was himself. One of the fundamental beliefs of this church is that if Jesus was the image of the invisible God, so too should we be. That when we're in our workplaces, when we're in our homes with our children and our spouses, we should be like an image of God that we were made in. We were made in God's image and now we've been empowered through Christ to once again bear that image. We got lost a little bit there in the middle as humanity. Humanity forfeited the image of God and picked up the image of death, sin, shame, guilt, brokenness. But now through Christ, which is why we, we're spending so much time just on one verse, because of that, because of Christ and his ministry, we now, empowered by his image, Christ's image, can now once again bear our image of God. We can now be like Jesus is to everyone in our world. But that's a transformation. That doesn't happen overnight. That, 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 that sometimes takes years, sometimes takes decades. Sometimes it, it takes a daily procession and an effort to be like, I, I need to journey more into this. However, the power for that journey is now an internal power, not an external behavior. Wow. And we'll, we'll dig more into that as well. And we go from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. All right, let's back up. Matter of fact, we're going to back up all the way to the last verse of chapter 2, because I, I just want to set a context for, for this fairly lofty idea. Like, this is a fairly lofty theological thought, and it's quite you know, philosophical in its, in its kind of demeanor. It's like, you know, we should be more like Jesus and we should be journeying like that and the power for that is in the Spirit. And these are all very high lofty ideas and sometimes that we can just leave them up there in the, 
in the ether, in the atmosphere, instead of actually bringing them down into what does that look like in my world? What does that look like when I've got to wake up tomorrow morning and go to work? What does that look like when I've got you know, kids that are frustrating me and toddlers that are screaming? And what does that look like when my spouse is, is just being such a blessing to me? And <laughs> you know, how, how do I be the image of God and the image that I was made in God's image of love and, and wholeness? And, 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 and how do I live that out in, in while I'm trying to fight and battle in this fairly broken world? Well, Corinth is actually a really good example of that because I guarantee you, you guys are a better church than Corinth. Yeah. Corinth was messed up. Like, you know, some of the issues that Paul had to deal with at Corinth was like, don't sleep with your mother-in-law. I haven't, I've never had to deal with that here. Like, it's never been an instruction or, or, or a you know, correction I've had to bring to Kingdom Hope. So well done. Well done. You guys are doing well. Don't sleep with temple prostitutes. Never had to really address that in this congregation. So, uh, so like Corinth was not like, it wasn't like a, an amazing church, but it was planted by Paul and Paul planted Corinth and but, you know, he was, he was also an apostle, so he kind of went on to other cities to plant other churches. And by the time he kind of got to a few other churches and a few other cities, you know, Corinth started pretty good, but they started to lose their way. And they lost their way in, in several main fashions. And one of them was that they were reverting back to the way they used to do things in the Old Covenant, like the way Moses taught them to do it, uh, the Ten Commandments and the Law and 613 commandments that they had to behave and do this and don't do that. And, and, and Paul is trying to establish a church that lives by the life of the Spirit. In other words, a Spirit-empowered life as opposed to a behavior-driven life, which is what the Old Covenant was. In the, in the Old Covenant, you had to wash the outside to try and clean the inside. Whereas Paul's saying, no, no, the, the new way we do things now is that Christ has cleaned the inside. And because it's clean... We now get a bath of our outside and we now get to change our behavior because of what's already transformed on the inside, right? So, but, but they were, because of Jewish influences, and they, they call the Judaizers, trying to bring them back to the way in which Moses did it. And the one way in which these guys tried to do it is basically attack Paul. They're like, Paul Schmall, who's Paul? Like, he's not even here anyway. Like, stop listening to Paul. We need to do it this other way. And they had these pastors and leaders and teachers come in and, and they were basically trying to lead the church in a way that was contrary to what Paul had initially instructed them. And they really undermined Paul's authority. And so Paul is basically now having to come back to Corinth and he's written a few more letters and there's at least four letters to Corinth that we know of. You know, we've got two of them and... Um, and, and and one of the things that Paul did was he came back and visited his church to kind of fix a few of these things up. And he references the visit in this letter. He came back and he said in this visit, he said, he said, y'all broke my heart. Like, like, well, most of you anyway. And so Paul kind of wears his heart on his sleeve a little bit. And he's like, you know, like, I, 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 I planted you, I, I formed you, and now I'm being challenged. And it was actually a little bit heartbreaking. And so Paul's been quite vulnerable here, but he's also trying to teach and admonish a church at the same time of, guys, we're better than that. Like, let's not behave like that. Let's not, let's not get distracted here. What we want to do is be Christ-like. And so one of Paul's main thrusts here in 2 Corinthians is not just these high lofty ideas of, hey, we now got life in the Spirit and we should be more like Jesus. It, it's actually more about us as a church, together as a community, what does Christian ministry look like and what does Christian service look like? So we start with the idea that actually it's, it's life in the Spirit and empowered by God's Spirit, but it doesn't stay there. It does actually land the plane in a fairly broken church on how to live life because of the idea that we're now living Christ-like lives. And, and like I said, it, Paul was landing that plane in a church that behaved much worse than what we do. Uh, you know, and it, you know, much more, you know, probably, probably like a Baptist church down the road, really. Like, it was more like that. Just kid, just kidding. Just kidding. It's really the Presbyterians. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm, 
move on. Uh, <laughs> there's no getting out of that. Um, so let, let's start in verse 217, because we're going to get a glimpse here of, of really some of the mess that Paul's trying to untangle here. He said, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. That's kind of a bit of a confusing sentence, but let me explain it this way. Essentially, these teachers and leaders and traveling evangelists came in and and, and they were teaching the church, but they were benefiting it probably financially and they were probably really doing it for their own gain. So their ministry, Christian ministry, was more about what they get from the church more than what they give to the church. And Paul's saying, no, look, that's just not the way Christianity is. Christianity is about, you know, Christian service and Christian ministry, not about, hey, there's a church thing now and I need to benefit from it. And before we skip over 2.17 too quickly and we start wagging our fingers at these Judaizers that are just treating the church like an organization that they can benefit from, perhaps we also need to analyze that maybe Western spirituality has taken us down that track a little bit ourselves, in that we may be more interested in behavior modification through good life coaching and a good speaker 20 minutes, 30 minutes on a Sunday to kind of make my life better through behavior modification as opposed to, actually, I've got, a resp- I've got a role to play in this thing called church. This is actually about me. It's not about me just sitting down and getting entertained and what I can get from this organization called the church, but actually realizing that I am the church and I've actually got a part to play, a role. I've got giftings from Jesus himself to administer to the body and to my community that actually I'm not a spectator, I'm a participator I, I'm, I'm not just a receiver, but I'm a contributor. And, and, uh, and really, this church thing isn't about necessarily my benefit, because I benefit from it, no doubt. But actually, it's about how now, because of what I've received, I can now live out in Christian ministry and service to not only my, my body of believers that I fellowship with, but also the city in which I live. Because that, that creeps in. I always love when people say, you know, we need to go back to church in the way the New Testament used to do it. I'm like, let's not, let's not do church the way the New Testament. The New Testament church were messed up in so many ways. And we figured some stuff out and we got a little bit better at it. Like for one, you know, we don't all sell our properties now and pull the resources and basically just live off that. Like, thank goodness, I like my home. Um, I'm happy for anyone else to pay off my mortgage, but I'd like to keep my house. Like... Now, so let, let's not go back to that. Let, 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 let's not go back to the fights and the, the, the entanglements and the, the selfish boasting and the, the different things that, that Paul is trying to untangle here. Let's realize that actually the church 2,000 years ago were wrestling with pretty much the same problems we're wrestling with now. And it's because of this secret ingredient that God put into the church called humanity. And human nature is, is, is fairly natural. And as long as you're sitting next to another human in church, there's going to be a problem in your church. I know that's really bad news because the person next to you this morning looks good. They've got a nice shirt on. They've got cologne on. They've got perfume on. They, they're, they're looking beautiful. They've got their nice Sunday smile on. But they're human and they've got problems. They've got hurts and, and scars and they've got stuff they're wrestling with and they're not perfect. They're trying to become more the image of Jesus himself. And just like you are. And, and so if, if you just give them a little bit of grace to you know, journey on into becoming more like Jesus, guess what? They'll do it for you too. Yes. I've gone a little bit silent here this morning. Do you know one of the things that Paul addresses here in, in sort of, you know, because they're talking about, okay, what are your credentials to lead the church? Because this is what these traveling evangelists, this is what their credentials are. And one of the things Paul kind of just levels across the playing field is this concept of, hey, hey, stop being married and infatuated with the idea that if you get a better leader, you'll get a better church. Oh, Now, sometimes that's true because the leader is part of the church. So, you know, as leaders, you know, even myself, I, I need to become a better leader, a better husband, a better father, better everything, so that I can contribute to a better church. But this is not a one-man show. If we want a better church, guess what? We all need to be a better church. Right? Yeah, we all love saying the church isn't an organization, the church is a people, right? 
except when the fact that it actually takes time for us to be responsible with that adage. Actually, I, I am the church, and so we need to, in Christian ministry, in Christian service, and, and look, this is not a guilt trip, because I'm, what I'm saying is, look at Corinth. They're dealing with the same stuff we're dealing with 2,000 years later. Thank goodness somebody wrote a book about it so we can learn from it. Right? So that, that's the foundation. Let, let's see what Paul does with that foundation. It, it's fairly normal human behavior. They're squabbling and fighting. They're trying to work out this Christian thing in a new world. And what does this life in the Spirit and looking more like Jesus mean when I'm trying to put food on the table, a roof over my kids' heads, trying to make sure my marriage is something that is habitable and happy and prosperous? Uh, and, and, you know, I'm just trying to live my life, and, and now I've got to try to do it with this empowerment of the Spirit. Do you want to see what Paul says about this? Well, let's, let's have a look, and we're going to land where we started, but let's see how he got there. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? In other words, why are we talking about commendations here? Like, I planted you as a church. Why do I need to prove myself to you in my leadership capabilities? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation for you, from you. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. What, what the Jewish uh, teachers and scribes used to do is they, when they would go around the synagogues, um, if they were a good itinerant minister, they would actually get a letter of commendation from, say, the synagogue at Capernaum, so that when they went to the synagogue at at, uh, at you know in Jerusalem, they could say, oh, look, I did some ministry at um, at Capernaum, and um, man, they loved me. I was like, I was epic there. Look, this is the letter they've written, right? And, and, and Paul is saying, look, the way the new covenant works, is it's, it's no longer about letters of commendation on how good you are, because the, the letter of commendation is now an epistle, which is just a fancy way of saying letter, but it's a letter written by whom? Jesus. And, and guess what the letter is? It's your life. Your life is the letter written by Jesus. And so Paul is saying, if you, want a, if you want a letter of commendation, then just read yourself. Because the transformation that Christ in you, the hope of glory, has performed is the letter of commendation that actually what we're talking about in this new world, this new life, this new spirit, this new testimony, new testament... That's your letter of commendation. If what we were teaching wasn't truth, then your lives wouldn't be transformed. <coughs> Excuse me. So clearly, you are an epistle, verse 3, of Christ, ministered by us. In other words, these teachers were saying, look how good my teaching is, buy my book, Seven Leadership Principles to an Awesome Epic Christian Life of Amazingness. And Paul's saying, don't, don't look at me. Look at what Christ has done in your life. Take your eyes off me and look to Him. Because it's His power, His transforming ways, His Word, His truth, that actually is the empowerment. I find that really comforting as a pastor. I can just say, don't look at me. Don't, don't look at me. Look at, look at Jesus. Here's the thing, something we need to come to terms with in modern Christianity is that, hey, leaders are going to disappoint you. It's just now that with the internet, we just, now have more, we just know of more leaders that are disappointing. You know, 30, 40 years ago, you, you knew of the, the leader that lived within 100 kilometers that let you down, so you'd probably come across one or two leaders in your Christian life that, you know, were disappointing. But now, I know of leaders in America that are disappointing. I know of leaders in China that are disappointing. I know of leaders in Sydney that are disappointing. I know of leaders everywhere that are disappointing. Uh, but here's the same thing. Stop looking at men and leaders as your spiritual gurus. Look to the Word of God and look to Jesus Himself. And, and, and one of the things Paul's saying here, he'll build on, is, is that the authority of Christian roles comes from Jesus, not from performance. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm not your spiritual guru, I'm an apostle, because that's the authority that Christ has given me. Not something I've earned, it's been given to me. But let's put it on a practical Christian level. What authority has, given, has God given you? What's your role in the body? 
Because whatever your gifting and whatever your role is, you've got a part to play. And it's not because you earned it, it's because you two are gifted. So what, what, like, what is it? Why are we expecting all of the ministry to happen on a platform in a 90-minute service on a Sunday? We've got to stop thinking that way. We've got to start thinking that actually ministry is something that the whole body does through the authority of Jesus Christ and that we've got actually parts to play in our world, whether it's in our family, in our homes, in our marriages, in our workplaces, in our city. God has gifted you, anointed you, and blessed you to be the church in your city. And so don't look to spiritual gurus. Look to Jesus and say, Jesus, what have you got me to do, what have you made me to do in your body in this world? I, like, I, I know we'd all want to sit back and just relax and just let the ministry happen from the platform while Ben plays violin beautifully and, and Ellen leads powerfully, but actually that, that, that's just when we get equipped. Ministry is when we go out into the world. I better speed up because uh, we're only up to verse 3. Clearly, you are an epistle. Turn to your neighbor and say, clearly, you are an epistle. And here he, here he compares the old covenant. Not on written on tablets of stone. So the testimony, the old covenant, the old testament was written on stone. What's this new testimony written on? Hearts. Do you know Christ is writing a story in you? Christ has written a story in you. And it's such an interesting story. It's such a powerful story. Your life is a story written by the grace of God. And just like any epic adventure and any epic Hollywood movie or any great Tolkien book, there's some great heights and there's some great tragedies. There's some really good victories and there's some really painful moments. And there's some, there's some amazing blessings. And there's just some times where the world has just kicked you in the belly. But you know what? All of it, when you wrap it up in the cover of God's grace, it's now, when you place it in His hands, a story that has His fingerprints all over it. I'm not saying He caused the pain. I'm not saying that He brought the brokenness. What I'm saying is that when you place your heart, your life, your dream, your goals, your experience in Christ's hands, he's able to write on it like a master author and turn it into an epistle that is read by the world and is much more accessible to them than John 3.16. The world is going to read you before they read the Gospel of John. And hopefully what they read in you will lead them to read what God wrote in the Apostle John. You're the greatest epistle your neighbor may ever meet. And we have such trust through Christ toward God that that we are sufficient ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. In other words, God's our empowerment, who also made us sufficient, not as ministers of the new covenant, of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Every time the Gospel, uh, sorry, the New Testament talks about the covenant, and this is a really good example of it, it uses it in terms of this. It's the word testament, and the Greek word there is, in other words, like a last will or a last de- testimony, basically. Testament. Now, here's the thing. Legally, with the last will of testament, you can either accept it or reject it, but you can't change it, right? And this is what these Judaizers are trying to do. They're trying to take the testament of Jesus, the will of God, and they're trying to manipulate it to fit into their own world. And it's a take-it-or-leave-it proposition. God's grace is sufficient. You have to access it by faith. Take it or leave it. Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. Take it or leave it. You can't change it. You can't mold Jesus into the image of man. Jesus molds you into the image of God. And you've got to get that the right way around. Verse 7. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, and look, the ministry of the Old Testament was glorious. There's nothing in God's law 
that is wrong or in, or, or, or in error. There is nothing that is fallible in God's law. It is perfect, but you've got to understand what its purpose was. The purpose of the law was to hold a mirror up to humanity and say, you're all, you're all ugly. You're real ugly. And you need, you, need some, you need some Jesus in your heart. Because unless you get Jesus in your heart, so the law, we look at the law, which is perfect, we realize how broken and ugly we are towards each other, towards God, towards each other, and even in ourselves. And we realize, oh my goodness, I need a savior. There is absolutely no possible way I can do this without Jesus. If you read God's law and you feel inadequate, that's the law working. And Jesus emphasized this beautifully when he came down and he's like, you know, um, you've, you've heard it said that if you don't murder each other, that's a good one, but, but I'm actually going to raise the standard a little bit, that even if you hate your brother, you've murdered him in your heart. So he took the law and he raised it even higher, right? And the reason was basically, in case you didn't get it the first time, you cannot fulfill the law. You need grace. You're not perfect. You never will be perfect outside the grace and love of Jesus Christ. So stop trying to perform to God's standard and let God's standard lift you up into the level of relationship. In verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? The law was glorious, but I tell you what, the covenant that we live under is even more glorious. For if the ministry of condemnation had the glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. It, Paul's doing a, a massive analysis here. There's actually seven different ways in which Paul analyzes the old versus the new. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. I've just read that. I apologize. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. In the, old, in the Old Testament, there was a time where Moses would actually meet with God and he'd, he'd hang out with him and he actually went up on Mount Sinai and he, he received the law and he brought it back down. And once he'd met with the Lord and, 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 and spoken to him, he came down and his face was shining with God's glory on him. And it was so much so that the Israelites couldn't, couldn't look at him. It was like, whoa, I can't even, like it's like blinding, but like looking at the sun. And so they put a veil over his face. And that's certainly one application of what Paul's referencing here. But there's a, there's a second application that you kind of miss because you kind of, your brain automatically goes to that story. But, but really, if you go months after or even years, I, I'm not sure how long this would have taken, but the glory that Moses had on his face, at some point, it, it faded. Like he didn't walk around with the veil over his face for the rest of his life. He, you know, at some point, the veil came off. Because the glory faded. And so Paul's using both applications here. He's saying the old, the old covenant was glorious, so much so that Moses had to veil his face. But just like Moses' glory that he beheld faded and passed away, so too the old covenant is fading in its glory and passing away. Because it's being exceeded by the new covenant. So this old glory is passing and fading, but it's being replaced by a superior and greater glory in Christ Jesus. And so we should, first of all, realize, once again, what the law actually had as its purpose, but second of all, realize what privileged times we live in. That as much as Moses was face to face, and the Hebrew of that is panim to panim. In other words, the full expression of one man to the full expression, like God and Moses were literally beholding one another. And that glory that Moses received from that encounter, as glorious as it was, and produced the law, 
it fades away. Why? Because human behavior modification will always fade away. There will always come a day, no matter how hard you try to be a great wife, to be a great husband, to be a great parent, to be a great businessman, there will always come a day where you're a little short on sleep, a little short on food, you're a bit hangry, and you end up just uh, letting that glory fade. A little. But there will, doesn't matter how many Tony Robbins tapes you listen to or Steve Furtick sermons you listen to, there, it comes a day where the, where the glory fades, right? Except when you stay empowered by the Spirit. Because it's that life-empowered Spirit that actually enables you to be everything that Christ requires of us. And so what, Mo, what faded in Moses doesn't fade in you. What well, faded in Moses doesn't fade in you. Right. In, in other words, and it gets even better. Not only does it not fade, it increases. It goes from glory to glory. Wow. In other words, like, like we could have like real honest Christian conversations in this room because we're all friends here. And we could be like, man, I saw your glory last week. It was a bit faded. But I tell you what, this week, you must have spent time in the presence or something because you're just looking glorious this morning. Like, you're looking amazing. Like, that, that could even just be a real honest marriage conversation, hey? It's like, hey, sweetheart, your glory's faded a little bit today. <laughs> is, what, is what Bonnie would say to me. I'm just... <laughs> did you guys think... <laughs> she calls me sweetheart. And then, and then me, as a, as a mature Christian, I'd be like, thanks for pointing that out, sweetheart. I'm, I'm going to adjust my attitude. And that would be the end of that conversation. <laughs> we would just move on in life. But in all seriousness, I think we need to get better at those conversations in church. And I think we also need to give more grace to each other to not always look so glorious. I I think this needs to be a safe place where we realize that sometimes when we rely too much on behavior modification, we fail. When when sometimes we get too much into striving, then we we fall short. And, And maybe that's not the time where we actually pick on or point out, maybe that's the time where we just come along and lift up and say, hey, come on, man. You're empowered by the Spirit. Like, I know it's tough, but let me, let's walk together at least for a little bit so we can get strong enough so that we can get back into that Spirit-empowered life to be everything that God has called us to be. But for some reason, I don't, I don't know how this happened, and, and, and I sort of get it because it's human nature, but sometimes we think that we have to be perfect before we come to church. And it's like, no, no, the, the, Jesus is the bath. That's where we've got to get clean and empowered and scrubbed up. Like, this is a hospital. This is where broken people come. And when people come in with their brokenness, we're like, what are you broken for? This is church. And it's like, no, no, that's exactly where broken people need to be because this is where the healing, the restoration, and the wholeness is, actually takes place through life in the Spirit. And so if you're messed up, you're in the best place. If, if you're broken, you, you're in the best place. Yeah. And, and what I'd love, and this is what Paul is saying to his messed up, broken church in Corinth, I'd, I'd love to say that to KH as well, is that, hey, actually, as we walk together more into the likeness of Christ, let's realize that it's not by our own power and our own strength. It's actually by Christ's strength and his anointing. That even though I'm weak, now, most people misquote this, and they say, he is strong. When I am weak, he is strong. Now, that's a misquote of the Bible. What Paul actually says is that even though I'm weak, I am strong because of Christ. So if you're weak here this morning and you're broken here this morning, let me remind you as your Christian brother, no, actually, you are strong. And if you need to be weak for a moment, this is the best place to be weak. If you need to be broken for a little bit, that's okay. This is the best place to be broken because in Christ, you are strong. In Christ, you are healed and restored. And you, you loved 
exactly the way you are because I know when you get the epistle that he's writing on your heart is a glory to glory epistle. And where you are, that's okay for now because I know Christ's love is going to form you more into his likeness as we journey together. And so that's where we come back down to verse 18. Well, let's start at 17. It says, now the, the Lord is the Spirit. So what's the Spirit empowering you? Christ himself. It's Jesus' Spirit that empowers you. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I, I don't want anyone to feel condemnation or, or, or shame when they come into this church or when they come into encounter with anybody in this church. <laughs> No, if you're carrying the image of God in, in Christ's spirit, then it's liberty and it's freedom. That, that's what they encounter when they encounter us. And this is verse 18. Let's land where we started. But we all, everyone here, everyone, what we all, with unveiled face. In other words, we don't need to be ashamed about our glory fading. Why? Because our glory comes from Jesus. We can take the veil off. Because one, it needs to be beheld. But second of all, our glory is not fading. So we don't need to hide, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. But let's back up to that word there. Actually, let's read the rest. Are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. But let's go back to the very beginning of verse 18. I'm going to sum up this whole sermon really, really simply. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding. The old covenant, the instruction was be holy. The new covenant, you're successful when you're beholding him. You, you want to be successful in the old covenant? You, you got to be holy. You want to be successful in the New Testament? Just behold him. Just behold him. Look at him. Embrace him. Bring him into your world. Bring him in to your home. Bring him into your business. Bring him into your world and behold him. And when you behold him as in a mirror, when you see Jesus, you'll see yourself. Amen. Oh, that's, that's what I'm meant to be like. That's what grace looks like. Oh, oh, that's what love looks like. Oh, that's what Christian ministry looks like. Oh, that's what service to my family looks like. Why? Because we're beholding him. And when we behold him, we see ourselves. Old covenant, be holy. New covenant, behold him. 